once again, everyone. This is a March Madness special exclusively here on CitrusTV.net. I'm David Guzman alongside Citrus TV men's basketball analyst Chris Lewis. And Chris, the brackets have been out for a while now. How's your bracket looking? My bracket has no blemishes right now. I like it the way it is. Hopefully when the games start, though, it'll stay the same way. Speaking of brackets, let's take a look at one, shall we? More specifically, the bottom half of the East region where we find the three seeds. Syracuse competing on Friday in Cleveland against Indiana State. Chris, first off, what are your overall impressions of this specific region and the Xavier Marquette matchup that awaits the winner of Syracuse? Well, Indiana for Syracuse, State? you're a three seed, you're facing a 14 seed, you have to expect to advance. And then the next matchup's kind of interesting, Xavier Marquette. Now, if Marquette wins, it's a Big East rematch from earlier in the season where Syracuse actually lost to Marquette. Or it could be Xavier, which presents some matchup problems for Syracuse. All right, Chris, we'll get to some more analysis in just a little bit. But first, let's set up some of the storylines heading into Friday as we head into the tip-off. It's been an up and down year for the Orange with coach Jim Beheim calling his team overrated at the beginning of the year and then the Orange suffering through a rough patch of Big East games at one point losing 6 of 8 after compiling a 26 and 7 record. Beheim knows there's only one thing on his mind going into Friday's game. I think the most important thing for the NCAA tournament is to make sure that you know we're as playing as well as we can play. Uh, going into that game. I think that, that's the key. I mean, that to me is always the most important thing. Let's try to get Syracuse uh, playing as well as we can play going into that game on Friday. Jim Beheim owns a 44-26 and record in the NCAA tournament. Over the last two years, the Orange has made trips to the Sweet 16, only to fall short of the Elite Eight. In 2009, it was Oklahoma and Blake Griffin that stopped the Cuse's run, and who can forget last season's stinging loss to Butler. Constant in any mention of Syracuse basketball is Beheim's signature 2-3 zone, and sophomore guard Brandon Trish knows that its bread and butter defense will be key to a win on Friday. I think because they haven't really played against zone, you know, um, a lot of teams, you know, they, they play mostly man-to-man, -to -man, you know, tough defense, but they don't practice against zone, and uh, our, um, I believe our zone is the best, you know, 2-3, you know, in America, so. It's definitely going to make them tough for them, for those who ever play. The reason why they call it March Madness is because any given team can win or lose on any given night. And it's in March when some of the most surprising moments in college basketball takes place. Syracuse had its own one shining moment in 2003 when it won the national championship. And that year, it had the number three seed. Ask Scoop Jardine this season, he'll tell you that this team has what it takes to win it all. It's winnable, you know. We just got to take it one game at a time, and I think we can do it. I mean, every team this year is really equal. There's really no teams that you're scared of or teams that there's more dominant than others. I mean, every team equal. It's about what team get hot at the right time and what teams play, you know, they basketball. And I think that's our whole focus. We want to play Syracuse basketball and just take it one game at a time, and we should be fine. We bring back our analyst Chris Lewis here to talk more Orange postseason basketball. And Chris, this team has been on a roller coaster ride all season long, up and down throughout. But March, always a way to start fresh. What's the mindset have to be going into Friday? It's all about the team motto, unfinished business for Syracuse. And you have to forget about the regular season. Might have been not exactly what they wanted. They were higher, dropped to lower, playing their best towards the end. But now it starts anew. You got to play your best going in. Everyone zero and zero. And I think that's the mindset Jim Beheim's really instilled in this team. You saw it on the, the guys talking about it at the selection show. They're ready to start new, and they want to show that this is the type of team that at the beginning of the year many people thought could reach the Final Four. Chris, the Sycamores are a team with a lot of momentum coming in, winning eight of their last nine, and also the Missouri Valley Conference champions. But Brandon Trish talked earlier about how the 2-3 zone could wreak havoc on this team. They haven't seen much of that zone What's the challenge going to be like for the Sycamores? Well, the challenge is for the Sycamores is it's also a challenge for Syracuse because the Sycamores like to spread the ball around. And you know the cliche that the ball moves faster than a man. And the Sycamores can pass the ball all over the place and get it to all their different scores. They have five different scores that average somewhere between 7 and 12 points per game. So while they don't have that one guy who can hurt you, they have a lot of different guys that can hurt. And that's one thing that the zone struggles to defend. 
And finally, looking at the orange, there's just so many players who have just contributed late, including Fab Mello, adding to the consistency of Rick Jackson. Then you remember Scoop Jardine having a couple of shots that sent it into overtime last week against UConn in the Big East tournament. Who's going to be the difference maker for the orange in the NCAA tournament? David, the difference maker is Rick Jackson for the first round game because look at it, Indiana State hasn't seen anybody like Rick Jackson, just a six foot ten guy who's so athletic, who could get those rebounds, who's a monster on the offensive block. If he's really playing his game, I don't see you any way Indiana State's able to defend Syracuse. Chris, let's talk more about the Sycamores on Sunday. All we knew about them was that Larry Bird used to play there. Now we know a little more about Syracuse's first opponent. Indiana State has won eight of their last nine games. Their only setback in that stretch was a six-point loss to Moorhead State, who is also in this year's tournament. This is a team that head coach Greg Lansing says is very unselfish with players averaging between 8 and 11 points per game. And one player to look out for is Jordan Printy. The 6'4 junior guard shoots nearly 50% from three-point range. All right, Chris, we now take a look at the rest of the East region. And if Syracuse moves on, they could possibly be seeing North Carolina and then Ohio State, should both of those teams survive and advance with the Orange. What are your thoughts on the East region? That's a tough region. You look at the top of that bracket, Ohio State. Ohio State, the number one overall seed in the tournament. And then you got Kentucky in there, too. And for Kentucky, I think this is a team that can really make some damage in the tournament. And they've been playing their best ball at the end of the year. They're well coached. Coach Calipari knows how to get the most out of his team when it's the underdog. And again, they're playing their best. They have Brandon Knight who can shoot the rock. When they, If they face Ohio State, I think Kentucky can, can come out of it. So for Syracuse, though, it's tough because both of those teams match up well against the Orange. A couple of Big East teams in the mix here as well. Nova coming off, not a great Big East tournament. And then you have West Virginia in the mix as well. How do you think those teams will be in the East region? Well, you have Villanova. Again, you mentioned it. They were sliding at the end of the year. And they have the George Mason team. But George Mason's a pretty good team. A lot of people say they're underseeded at an eight seed. I see that as a tough matchup for Villanova. And West Virginia, they're lucky they got Clemson. Because I think while Clemson is athletic, I don't think that they're the type of consistent team that can beat West Virginia. All right, and Chris, do you see Syracuse coming out of the East region? No, I, I don't see Syracuse coming out of the East region. I see Kentucky. I like Kentucky's matchup against Ohio State. While that will be a great game, I just don't think that Ohio State or Kentucky, they're, they're good matchups for Syracuse. So whatever team wins that game, Ohio State, Kentucky, I think will beat the Orange. All right, Chris, let's talk about that Big East field for a second. 11 teams selected from this conference. That's the record for most teams selected from one conference. And six teams in action on Thursday, five on Friday. Judging from how these teams have done in conference play, which of these teams can make a deep run in this tournament? I'm looking at Louisville, and Louisville's a team that plays a distinct style of basketball, this in-your-face pressure defense. And in a tournament, if you play a distinct style that teams haven't seen before, you have a great chance of advancing. And for Louisville, they also have the scorers on the offensive end. Preston Knowles is a magician when he has the ball in his hands. And you got Siva, who's good at getting to the basket. And you have Turek, who's that shooter that you always need in March. So Louisville has all the dimensions needed for a deep run in the tournament. St. John's, Gonzaga, West Virginia, then Notre Dame taking on Akron. 11 Big East teams means 11 games to look out for. What's one game to look out for other than SU's, of course? UConn, and that's the interesting team because they're coming off of that Big East tournament run where they won five games in five days. Now they face a Bucknell team, and they play a Thursday game. I think the NCAA tournament selection committee was a little bit cruel to UConn making them play Thursday, but do they have the energy to play against a Bucknell team that has upsets in their past? Chris, let's take a look at... The rest of the brackets right now, Kansas, Pittsburgh, and Duke are the other number one seeds in this tournament. Let's start with the West. This bracket seems to be one of those you know, rare straightforward brackets. Are there any upsets to look out for? It, this is, yeah, it's a straightforward bracket. I don't have many major upsets in here. Maybe if UConn's a bit tired since you can clip them in the second round, but other than that, no, not really any real upsets in here. I think Duke has a nice path here into the Final Four. Now looking in the Southwest, you talked earlier about Louisville, Chris. Can they make a deep run and maybe even beat Kansas in the Sweet 16? I had them, David, as my team to watch for a reason. And I think they match up very well against Kansas. While Kansas is a talented team, they have Morris Twins are there, but they don't have a real natural point guard that can handle the Louisville pressure. They'll go after Kansas, and I think Kansas will lose to Louisville. And then I like Louisville advancing to the Elite Eight, beating Purdue, and getting to the Final Four. And finally getting to the southeast, you've got Florida with a two seed, St. John's in the mix as well, not to mention Pittsburgh with the top seed. 
despite losing early in the Big East tournament. Chris, where do you start in this region? The Southeast region is crazy. I mean, you look at it. I think Pitt's the weakest number one. That's safe to say. Florida, the weakest number two. And then BYU, the weakest number three. So that means it's wide open for anyone. Pittsburgh, I think Old Dominion's a tough matchup for them in the second round. And then it just opens up the path for teams like Old Dominion and Belmont to make a run. Then on the bottom half of the bracket, look out for Michigan State. This team was playing its best ball at the end of the year. They have Kalen Lucas, who's an elite scorer, playing at that All-American level that we thought he'd play at the entire season. And Tom Izzo knows how to get his boys to play in March. I think that might be a dark horse team that can make a Final Four run. All right, Chris. Well, by Thursday, 64 teams will be left. And then in a couple of weeks, a national champion will be crowned. Never too early to start thinking about the Final Four. Who do you have winning it all? Sorry, Syracuse fans. In my Final Four, I have Kentucky coming out of that region. And then also Duke, Louisville, and then my surprise, Michigan State making that Final Four run. But my champion goes back to the Blue Devils. They're going to repeat as national champions. They just have too much championship balance from their head coach, Coach K, who's done it before. Nolan Smith is an elite scorer. And then you have Kyle Singler, who can score from the inside and the outside. Then they have the shooter and Seth Curry. Not to mention, they could get Kyrie Irving back. If they get him back, look out. This is going to be a long day for the opponent. Duke is my national champion. And you heard it right here on CitrusTV.net. But so many things could happen, and that's the beauty of March Madness. Thanks, Chris. That'll just about do it on this web-exclusive edition, Citrus TV Sports Special, previewing Syracuse in the NCAA tournament. We have reporters in Cleveland who are ready to give you the latest news, notes, and analysis. Keep at it and follow CitrusTV.net, the sports blog on that page. For now, that's Chris Lewis. I'm David Guzman. Goodbye for now. Thank you.